as it is written, it was so. Out of the mud which formed at the mouth of two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, a new world emerged, and with it, a new way of life. The earth brought forth abundantly grass and herb yielding seeds. We begin our journey into mankind's imperial past with the Akkadian Empire, the first the world bore witness to. Established near the end of the 3rd millennium BC by the legendary Sargon of Akkad, it stretched across the regions of Mesopotamia, Anatolia, and the Levant, claiming much of present-day Iraq and even parts of Iran, Syria, Kuwait, Jordan, and Turkey. Akkad's rise and fall marks one of the most riveting chapters of the story of Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization. It was a time of great change when a peripheral warrior society led by a charismatic ruler brought to heel perhaps the most advanced civilization on the face of the earth. That may sound like a familiar story, one that brings to mind Alexander the Great, Attila the Hun, and what seems like countless other figures. But Sargon of Akkad was the first of them all. And since there can be no firm understanding of either his or Akkad's origins without at least a passing familiarity with the broader Mesopotamian civilization that they belong to, we will devote the entirety of this episode to what came before them. In doing so, we will have the context necessary to make sense of the Akkadians and their successors. Because as certainly as day follows night, so too does one empire follow another. Now the Arab bureaus seem to think you would be of some use to them in Arabia. Why, I can't imagine. You don't seem able to perform your present duties properly. I cannot fiddle, but I can make a great state from a little city. What? For Mr. Please, sir, a Greek philosopher. It was the ancient Greeks who gave us the name Mesopotamia, translating to the land between rivers. However, the etymological roots of the name run deeper, with the Greeks most likely borrowing from Aramaic and Akkadian in turn. The rivers referred to in the name are, of course, the world-famous Tigris and Euphrates, which empty into the Persian Gulf. Fed by the snow-capped Taurus and Zagros Mountains, these relentless, silt-carrying rivers were violent, subjecting the surrounding lands to devastating, four-story high floods every spring when the snows would melt. It was only in the second half of the 4th millennium BC, as temperatures rose and precipitation levels fell, that the sister rivers of Mesopotamia were calmed, becoming less prone to outbursts of watery wrath. The effect was felt most keenly in the silt-enriched southern Mesopotamian floodplains, enabling human communities sustained by fishing and farming to form alongside these two rivers. To combat the lack of rainfall, these communities undertook elaborate irrigation projects. They dug canals, built dikes, and cultivated new tracts of farmland, which led to burgeoning populations and the development of so-called hydraulic civilizations. According to the traditional narrative, the scope and scale of these projects necessitated the centralization of power and social stratification, thereby setting into motion a process that began with the city, proceeded with the city-state, and organically culminated in kingdoms and empires. However, this narrative has recently come under fire by historians who have pointed to more egalitarian communities administered by town councils, which were perfectly capable of creating irrigation systems without the supervision of an overlord. Actually, what happened after the invention of agriculture around 10,000 years ago is a long period of around another 4,000 years in which villages largely remained villages, and actually there's very little evidence for the emergence of rigid social classes, which is not to say that nothing happened. Over those 4,000 years, technological change actually proceeded apace. Without kings, without bureaucracies, without standing armies, these early farming populations fostered the development of mathematical knowledge, advanced metallurgy, they learned to cultivate olives, vines, and date palms. They invented leavened bread, beer, and they developed textile technologies, the potter's wheel, the sail. Such examples raise the question, is there anything inevitable in the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a small elite? A question that lingers when we turn our attention to Uruk, 
the earliest of Sumeria's city-states. Known as Erek in the Bible and Warka in Arabic, the name Uruk comes from Akkadian, a slightly modified version of the original Sumerian. And despite the name's unfortunate resemblance to the Urukai of Middle-earth, it is the name that persists to this day, both for the city-state and the corresponding period in Mesopotamian history. Unlike Tolkien's orcs, the people living at Uruk seem to have been a pretty sophisticated and clever bunch, having invented not just the first city-state, but also the first system of writing, with their artistic and bureaucratic conventions providing a template for the Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians alike. A Sumerian poem from 1800 BC, much later, commemorates the supposed birth of writing. Because the messenger's mouth was heavy, and he couldn't repeat the message, the lord of Kulaba, a district in Uruk, patted some clay and put words on it, like a tablet. Until then, there had been no putting words on clay. Interestingly, because of a clay tablet dating back to this time bearing a pictographic representation of a wheeled wagon, we also know that the people at Uruk made use of, if not invented, that other hallmark of civilization, the wheel which was probably used for pottery first. But whether or not they invented it, and regardless of whether its first uses were reserved to pottery, there is an important lesson here. In those days, history was not written by the victors. The victors were those who wrote down anything at all. Other cities like Eridu came before Uruk, but because the people of Uruk wrote things down, we know much more about it, and can therefore attribute more to its remarkable civilization. A civilization that lasted an enormous span of time, for the better part of the 4th millennium BC. At its height, Uruk is thought to have reached an urban population of 40,000, with that number roughly doubling when one also takes into account the cities and colonies under its rule. Besides its population, so huge for its time, and its control of surrounding territories, Uruk further distinguished itself from past cities through its monumentality. Its sandal-clad workers, nourished on water skins, beer, and bread, use new tools like hammers, chisels, braces, saws, and nails, supplied by wheeled wagons and river-faring boats, to build structures that reached for the heavens, structures that were meant to last, made not merely of mud brick, like past cities, but a combination of limestone, clay, bitumen, and a primitive concrete mix composed of gypsum and baked bricks. Perhaps the best example is the White Temple, built on top of the Anu Ziggurat, that is, a terrace dedicated to Anu, the king of the Mesopotamian pantheon of gods. At this point, you may be wondering, who was overseeing all of this activity? Who ruled Uruk? The answer is hotly debated to this day. The first historian studying this period, ambiguously referred to as Assyriologists, would have us believe that it was a class of temple priests, and that Uruk is the foremost example of the transition from primitive democracy to temple rule taking place in the broader Mesopotamian world. What we know for certain is that the city's temples, like the legendary White Temple, were indispensable for the smooth functioning of society. It almost goes without saying that these towering structures served both as ineffable expressions of power and sites of worship. But in addition to that, these temples were charitable institutions that provided widows, orphans, and other unfortunates with sustenance, not unlike medieval monasteries. Nor did their importance end there, as they also functioned as storehouses and workshops in which barley grain was stored, wool was produced, bread was leavened, wine was made, and beer was brewed. David Graeber and David Wengro, two noted anthropologists writing on the subject, have even gone so far as to refer to these temples as the very first factories that we know of, with priests overseeing the allocation of tribute to the gods, a proto-corvée system of labor, distribution of raw materials, and even quality control of finished products using cylinder seals, which functioned as a form of stamp or signature. For record-keeping purposes, these same temple priests also pioneered the use of the earliest version of cuneiform, a system of writing that gets its name from the Latin cuneus, meaning wedge, due to the script's wedge-shaped characters. Such record keepers used styluses to carve characters representing goods and livestock into soft, wet clay tablets that were left to bake under the sun. Eventually, these two innovations, cylinder seals and proto-cuneiform, 
became linked together, as later seals would feature cuneiform characters. This allowed for a more economical way of disseminating information, better suited to the uses of a record keeper concerned with tallying up crop yields or confirming the receipt of a new shipment. Yet another innovation was called the bula, a clay sphere used as a token to represent different goods. Clever as they were though, the temple priests at Uruk would never have guessed that this pictographic script developed for the purpose of mere bookkeeping would form the basis for the world's earliest literature, poetry, and legal codes, opening the door to a centralization of power the likes of which the people at Uruk had not known. For, although temple priests controlled so many aspects of commodity production, we now have evidence to suggest that public building projects and the dispensation of justice were both still in the hands of assemblies, composed of the sons and daughters of Uruk, as they would call themselves, with women being able to take part in the proceedings, hold land in their own right, rise in temple administrations, and even assume control of the household under certain circumstances. This is in marked contrast to the more advanced, yet demographically restricted democracy that would develop in 6th century BC Athens. As we reach the end of the Uruk period, which spelled the end of temple rule, although not the end of the city-state of Uruk itself, one may speculate that it is the lack of centralized authority and the consequent inability to mobilize manpower and resources on a sufficient scale that prevented Uruk from creating an empire of its own. Although it established colonies as far away as Syria and Iran, bringing back plunder and slaves, each foreign adventure would cost the people of Uruk more than it yielded. Trade was the more profitable course of action, and a perfectly viable response to addressing the growing needs of an urban population too big for its britches, not unlike the situation medieval Florence found itself in amid the fertile Arno Valley of Italy, with trade famously being its lucrative recourse. And much like Florence, Uruk, a region that lacked some of the critical resources it needed, like minerals, trees, and metals, eventually turned to trade as a means to enrich and embellish its civilization, not just feed it. Sourcing copper, lead, silver, and gold from the Zagros Mountains, obsidian from Anatolia, cedar from Lebanon, and even lapis lazuli from distant Badakhshan in modern Afghanistan. But even though trade would proliferate in the centuries to come, it would by no means prevent conquest, colonization, and enslavement from becoming increasingly ubiquitous modes of advancing a city-state's interests. Uruk was no exception to these evolving, or devolving, rules of engagement, and its most famous resident, who had yet to come, would be a primary practitioner of this high-stakes game. That brings us to the start of the early dynastic period in the beginning of the 3rd millennium BC. The age of warrior kings and dynasties had finally come, with power shifting from temples to palaces, though still checked by temple administrations, citizen assemblies, and hostile neighbors. It is the age that roughly corresponds to that of the flood alluded to in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the most famous cuneiform text of all time etched into a clay tablet now kept in the British Museum. You've probably heard about the epic before, and you may be aware of the parallels to the flood myth of the Book of Genesis. However, unlike the God of the Old Testament, whose wrath was visited upon mankind for its corruption and sin, the Sumerian god Enlil, patron deity of wind, air, and storms, unleashes the same punishment on the earth simply because all the noise of these prospering cities was depriving him of rest. I guess even Mesopotamian gods needed their beauty sleep. The epic itself actually takes place hundreds of years after the flood, by which time priests and citizens alike paid homage to the Ensi, meaning Lord of the Plowland, or more simply, the Lugal, meaning Great Man, titles both loosely interchangeable with Prince or King. One such figure was Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, partly historical and partly mythical, his dealings with the gods immortalized in the form of a national epic, not unlike in Achilles, King Arthur, or Ragnar Lothbrok for the Mesopotamians. The epic represents the time of Gilgamesh as a time of war, with unguarded towns giving way to walled cities and temples giving way to palaces. In marked contrast to the preceding Uruk period, the archaeological record of the 3rd millennium BC bears this out, 
with traces of walls, palaces, elaborate burials, and royal inscriptions all beginning to appear in greater abundance. According to the epic, Gilgamesh is a catalyst for this process, exhorting the elders of Uruk to wage war against the northern civilization of Kish, ruled by a king of its own according to perhaps the second most important cuneiform text in our possession today, the Sumerian King List. It is Gilgamesh's inclusion in this list that gives credence to the claim that he was a real, historical figure. Regardless, there is something we can learn from the story of Gilgamesh. By its conclusion, Gilgamesh beholds the imposing fortifications that he had ordered to be erected around Uruk, and concludes that it is by such means, the raising of monumental works meant to withstand the test of time, that humans can aspire to immortality. This, after the gods had withheld the gift of corporeal immortality to Gilgamesh because of his inability to endure sleeplessness. Pretty hypocritical in light of the whole Enlil incident, if you ask me. But hypocrisy is the prerogative of gods even with those gods who had once been men. In a poetic twist of fate, it would be Udnapishtim, the man who achieved immortality after playing the role of Noah and saving mankind from the flood sent down by Enlil, who would tell Gilgamesh that his quest was in vain. You will never find that life for which you are looking. When the gods created man, they allotted to him death, but life they retained in their own keeping. As for you, Gilgamesh, Fill your belly with good things. Day and night, night and day. Dance and be merry. Feast and rejoice. Let your clothes be fresh. Bathe yourself in water. Cherish the little child that holds your hand. And make your wife happy in your embrace. <laughs> For this too is the lot of man. It is advice that Gilgamesh would take to heart, dying in his bed at a ripe old age after a glorious reign as Lugal of Uruk. To honor him after his death, it is said that his subjects temporarily diverted the course of the Euphrates to bury him in the riverbed. The same tale is recited for the deaths of Attila the Hun, Alaric the Goth, and Genghis Khan, exactly the type of company that Gilgamesh would keep, all of whom did in fact achieve immortality, in the sense that we still speak of them to this day. We now approach the end of the early dynastic period of Mesopotamia roughly halfway through the 3rd millennium BC. By this time, in addition to more widely disseminated and developed versions of cuneiform and cylinder scrolls, we see the introduction of a lunisolar calendar for keeping track of harvests and religious festivals, the abacus, a hand-operated tool for calculation, and with it, a sexagesimal number system, which explains why we have 360 degrees in a circle, 60 seconds in a minute, and 60 minutes in an hour. It's an achievement that the Babylonians typically get credit for when, in reality, it was a Sumerian inheritance. There were also important advances in art, increasingly more lavish, monumental, and commemorative of royal might and violence. One such example is a limestone monument which survives only in fragmented form, called the Stele of the Vultures, which you can find today in the Louvre. This two-sided stele, blending the real and the surreal, depicts the aftermath of a battle, the bodies of the dead trampled beneath the feet of a victorious army, as gods and vultures alike claim their due. It is the start of a long tradition of monumentalizing martial triumphs, which the Akkadians would emulate and the Assyrians would perfect. It celebrates the moment that the ascendant city-state of Lagash, under its king Ianatum, defeats its neighbor, Uma. In forcing Uma to become its tributary, and annexing nearly all of Sumer, including Uruk, Ur, and Larsa, Ianatum served as a sargonic prototype, simultaneously inspiring dread in the hearts of men and fondness in the hearts of gods. To immortalize his many triumphs, Ianatum had a stone inscription made, which you can also find in the Louvre today. It read, Ianatum, the Ensi of Lagash, who was granted might by Enlil, who constantly is nourished by Ninhursag with her milk whose name Ningirsu had pronounced, who was chosen by Nanshi in her heart, the son of Akurgal, the Ensi of Lagash, conquered the land of Elam, conquered Urua, conquered Uma, conquered Ur. At that time, he built a well made of baked bricks for Ningirsu in his wide temple courtyard. Ionatum's god is Shulutula. Then did Ningirsu love Ionatum. However, 
when Lugal Zagesi's reign as priest king of Uma began, the predominance of Lagash was overturned. Through a winning combination of military prowess and marriage diplomacy, Lugal Zagesi wrested control of Sumeria from Lagash, conquered Kish, and established Uruk, the city of Gilgamesh, as his capital. It was at this point that Lugal Zagesi took the title Lugal Kalama, or King of the Land. But Lugal Zagesi would pass none of these titles or lands to his children. Instead, this warrior king, the most successful since Ianatum, would be subdued by the hero of our story, Sargon of Akkad. Humiliatingly, after the walls of Uruk were torn down, the man formerly called Lugal Kalama, king of the land, would be fitted with a collar, like a dog or slave, and dragged to Enlil's temple in Nippur. After that, he passes from the pages of history, and we hear no more of him. Ultimately, Lugal Zagesi would be the last ethnically Sumerian king before the rise of Sargon. Ever since the age of Gilgamesh, warrior kings had begun to make their mark on Mesopotamia, especially in the less prosperous and more socially stratified north, a region more driven by the warrior ethos than the long-established city-states of the south, with their temple administrations and local assemblies. And now, for the first time in Mesopotamian history, the north would dominate the south, with Sargon of Akkad playing the role of a Philip of Macedon. In both cases, one can observe the rough, hardened warriors of the periphery bringing a sophisticated center of culture and commerce to heel, thereby opening the door to a reinvigorated civilization reaching unparalleled heights, even if it was at the cost of countless lives. Abraham, take my child into thy hands, that he may live to thy service. What kind of man does it take to build an empire? And not just any empire, but the very first in the history of man, when only kingdoms and cities had come before. We have only scattered fragments to consult, but these pieces of the puzzle tell us something nonetheless about how the Mesopotamians would answer that question. Their answer comes in the form of two stories that take us all the way back to the third millennium BC. Sumer, the mother of civilization, had raised to adolescence a brilliant but unruly brood of cities, kings, and dynasties mired in fratricidal rivalry. And now the birth throes of empire grip this land, staining its sons and daughters drop by drop with blood. Soon, they would be awash in it. Though the deluge was let loose not by a Sumerian, but instead by an orphaned outsider from the north. His name was Sargon of Akkad, and he would be the blood-soaked prophet of empire. In the birth legend of Sargon of Akkad, a Neo-Assyrian text, we are told that as a mere infant, he was sent down the Euphrates in a basket of rushes sealed with bitumen, an origin story not unlike that of Moses. And we are also told that Sargon's mother bore him in secret, and that she was a figure of importance, a high priestess devoted to the cult of the goddess Ishtar. So this may have been for his own protection. Still, the identity of Sargon's father was unknown to him, so we can only speculate as to why Sargon needed to be spirited away. Perhaps his father was a king, making Sargon a threat to the legitimate line of succession. Or perhaps he was nothing more than a common rogue who seduced or forced himself on Sargon's mother, making him a child of regret. Regardless, the infant survived this baptismal ordeal, carried by a strong current to a man named Aki, a simple drawer of water who would raise Sargon as his own. 
After that, we are told that Sargon's childhood was laborious. He worked as an orchard keeper, and for all intents and purposes, it seemed that his lot in life would be a simple one. But Ishtar, goddess of love, fertility, and war, had other plans for him. This goddess, the same one Sargon's mother served as a temple priestess, was the Mesopotamian Aphrodite, with a more warlike bent. She was known to seduce mortals and raise them up to divine heights, even if only for a single night. Gilgamesh famously spurned her, knowing all about the perils that often befell one of her hapless lovers. In return for this slight, she killed his closest friend. Unlike Gilgamesh, Sargon seems to have embraced this divine affiliation, and as we shall see, it would serve him exceedingly well. With Ishtar's blessing, Sargon was lifted beyond his humble station as an orchard keeper, and he soon found himself in the court of King Urzababa of Kish, occupying the position of cupbearer. With such proximity to the king, Sargon held an important but dangerous position. According to the Sumerian poem Sargon and Urzababa, the second of our two stories, Sargon was loyal and honest in his conduct toward his master, even as the gods conspired to revoke Urzababa's divine right of kingship. We do not know why the gods turned against Urzababa, but their fickleness was a well-established theme by this point, especially when it came to granting kingship. To begin to understand them, one must accept that the Mesopotamian gods were in and of the land itself. They behaved no differently from the freak storms that ravaged those plains, heralded but briefly by ominous clouds that streaked across the sky, only to disappear just as swiftly when Enlil lost interest in sending down lightning bolts and thunderclaps. And it would be none other than Enlil who decided to revoke Urzababa's kingship. For Ishtar's part, she was only too happy to continue playing her role as Sargon's watchful guardian, helping him overcome the intrigues of Urzababa's court. It would not be long after Sargon's appointment that master and cupbearer alike became afflicted with terrible nightmares. One of these even resulted in Urzababa passing urine, blood, and pus in the middle of the night, with the poem comparing him to a fish floundering in brackish water. That same night, Sargon's slumber would also be disrupted by a dream in which Urzababa was drowned in a river of blood sent by Ishtar. Groaning and gnashing his teeth, Sargon's distress was so great that he was soon awoken by an attendant and summoned to the alerted king's presence. He was then questioned as to the contents of his dream, and much to the credit of the young Sargon, he answered with unvarnished honesty. This was not the most prudent course of action, but then again, those favored by the gods play by different rules. Your majesty, said Sargon to Urzababa, in my dream there was an extraordinary young woman, high as the sky, wide as the world, standing strong as a fortress wall. To me it seemed as if she drowned me in a great flood, a river of blood. Frightened by this ill omen which he rightly took to portend his doom, Urzababa dismissed Sargon. Left to his own devices, it became clear to him, Sargon had to die. And so Urzababa began to scheme and plot. Why Urzababa decided against simply executing this foreign upstart remains a mystery. It may have been that Sargon was popular not just with the gods, but also with the people of Kish, making the act of killing him a political liability. Whatever the case, Urzababa's hasty scheme involved tasking Sargon, who regularly ran errands for him, to deliver to his chief smith a bronze hand mirror. The unsuspecting Sargon was then to be thrown into the smith's forge, located in the Isikil, the fated house. When the appointed time came, Sargon, none the wiser, took the mirror and proceeded to the Isikil, where Ishtar herself was said to have awaited him. She barred the entrance on the grounds that Sargon, being polluted with blood, was forbidden from entering a site considered holy. Urzababa Smith had no recourse but to meet Sargon at the gate of the fated house instead where he collected the mirror and returned to the forge, leaving Sargon unharmed. Then, some time passed, the calm before the storm, until Sargon, still none the wiser, returned to Urzababa's palace. The king became even more frightened, and he was now assured of the cosmic reweighing of the scales that was taking place. And so he concocted an even more harebrained scheme. He dispatched Sargon on another errand, this time to meet with the famed Lugal Zagazi, the king of Uma who had conquered much of Sumer and ruled from the ancient city of Uruk. Sargon was to bring to Lugal's Gezi a written message that requested Sargon be killed. 
A similar story is told in the Iliad of Bellerophon, the son of Poseidon who slew the mythical Chimera. He too was dispatched with a written message that was meant to spell his doom, except in his case it was bound in a sealed envelope. But as the Sumerian poem makes only too clear, this is before the advent of papyrus scrolls, so any such message with which Sargon would be entrusted would have been written on a clay tablet, its contents laid bare to the literate, which Sargon almost certainly was. Barring some secret cuneiform code that the two kings shared, this makes for a disappointing plot hole in an otherwise entertaining story, muddling its climax. When Sargon reached Uruk, we are left to assume that he either already knew of the plot by reading the clay tablet, or he found out from Lugal Zagazi thereafter. Either way, following this revelation, Sargon got to work, making allies with Lugal Zagazi even as he supposedly seduced his wife according to one bit of juicy Mesopotamian gossip. He then marched on Kish alongside him. Not long after that, we find Sargon seated on the thrones of Kish and Akkad alike having made one king soil himself and cuckolding another. Not bad for a gardener. As you may have surmised already, it could very well be that both of these stories are pure fiction. But then again, let us consider that parts of the saga may be true. Sargon of Akkad may have been a self-made man, a palace gardener brought high and caught in the intrigues of a court and city threatened by the ascendant Lugal Zagazi. This would explain any record of why Urzababa was so on edge. Perhaps the real Sargon was a more astute political operator, sensing which way the wind was blowing and turning on Urzababa without any outright provocation. Perhaps he had already ascended from cupbearer to ruler of Akkad and thereby meant to secure his city's independence from Kish. Either of these explanations seems more palpable when we consider that a state of conflict may have existed between Urzababa and Lugal Zagazi making it unlikely that the former was in a position to make any requests of the latter. But we simply cannot know for certain. Now, as we pass from myth to history, let us take a break from the sequence of events that make up the life of Sargon and discuss what we know of his city, Akkad, as well as the surrounding region, the people, and the language that they spoke. Much like Sargon, little is known for certain about the origins of Akkad and its people. The city was either founded by Sargon or brought to prominence by him, a prominence that outlasted his lifetime, with the city still being referred to in the days of the Achaemenid Empire. Sadly, the exact location of the city of Akkad has been lost to the sands of time, or more precisely, the sands of modern-day Iraq. We suspect that it is located somewhere within a 20-mile radius of Baghdad, and it could be that it is buried underneath the city itself. We do not know where the people of Akkad came from, or how long they inhabited the northern border of Sumer. They seem to have been outsiders, a rough and hardy nomadic bunch who favored herding over farming. Their winters and summers were harsh, even if the location they occupied was remarkably well situated, with the fertile Sumerian plains to the south, the mineral-rich highlands of present-day Iran to the east, and the pastoral lands of the middle and upper Euphrates to the north. The center of gravity in the region seems to have been Kish, which faced only token resistance from the cities of Mari and Akshak. Therefore, it is little wonder that Kish would play such a prominent role in the rise of Sargon. On the topic of language, Sargon and his people spoke not Sumerian, but Akkadian, a language of Semitic origins. Semitic is no doubt a term you've heard before, but perhaps not in this context. It is a term that was coined in the late 18th century to describe a group of related languages like Akkadian, Aramaic, Arabic, and others. Because Semitic was a regionally concentrated language prior to the rise of the Islamic Caliphates, it has also come to describe a people with a distinct set of cultural traditions, namely the Hebrew and Arabic peoples. Today, Arabic is the most widely spoken Semitic language, with Hebrew and Amharic and Ethiopian language also being classified in this way. Ancient Sumerian, on the other hand, is not a Semitic language. It is what's called a language isolate, meaning a language with no known descendants. After the rise of the Sargonic Empire, Sumerian would become a sort of lingua sacra used in ceremonial contexts until its death, while Akkadian would be like English today, the lingua franca of the Mesopotamian world, used for political purposes, literary works, and by traders who had no other way to communicate with each other. 
It is because of the Akkadians enduring success in empire building that the language is called what it is in the first place, and it would develop into the language spoken by the later Babylonians and Assyrians with different dialects. However, the Akkadians never developed writing, so for this purpose they adopted Sumerian cuneiform, which was progressively adapted over time. Under Sargon's successors, new cuneiform characters would be introduced, and the Akkadian cuneiform that appeared in administrative documents would assume a large, elegant, widely spaced rectilinear shape that distinguished it from earlier Sumerian cuneiform. But in the early stages of this linguistic transition, cuneiform writing was simply meant to be read in Sumerian and then translated verbally to Akkadian, suggesting the prevalence of a bilingual tradition with Sargon himself probably being fluent in both Sumerian and Akkadian. Let us now return to where we left off in the life of Sargon. The rest of the story is better grounded in history, but it proceeds at a dizzying pace nonetheless. For not long after he assumed control of Kish and Akkad, Sargon turned on his former ally, Lugal Zagazi. At this point, Lugal Zagazi controlled Uruk, the once proud city of Gilgamesh, his native city of Uma, as well as Ur, Nippur, Eridu, Zabala, Lagash, and Larsa. Going up against him was equivalent to taking on all of Sumer. And yet somehow, Sargon emerged victorious. In defeating Lugazagazi and all of his allies, Sargon would capture as many as 50 governors and just as many cities. These battles would be the first of 34 campaigns that Sargon supposedly took part in during his 56-year reign, an extraordinary military record, even if our grasp on all the details is tenuous at best. Indeed, we know frustratingly little about the means with which Sargon triumphed over his foes, both on a strategic and a tactical level. We know that he was able to feed an army of 5,400 men, but we have limited insight into what sort of odds he faced. And furthermore, there is no battle of Guagamela or siege of Elysia that we can point to as evidence of his military genius. But the results of a great captain speak for themselves, and it is the results, bloody and destructive as they are, that surviving Akkadian art and literature almost lovingly dwell on. Take, for instance, the inscription on a clay tablet found in Nippur, celebrating the exact moment Sargon triumphed over Lugal Zagazi. Quote, Sargon, king of Akkad, overseer of Ishtar, king of Kish, anointed of Anu, king of the land, governor of Enlil, he defeated the city of Uruk and tore down its walls. In the battle of Uruk he won, took Lugal Zagazi, king of Uruk, in the course of the battle, and led him in a collar to the gate of Enlil. End quote. In addition to that, we have a stele depicting Sargon smiting Lugal Zagazi on the head with a mace, an act of violence which in those days explicitly symbolized conquest. With Lugal Zagazi safely out of the picture and the city of Uma destroyed, Sargon consolidated his control of Sumer before setting his sights on more distant lands. Though the line between conquest and raid becomes blurred, we know Sargon and his men made it as far as Elam and Susa in present-day Iran, and Amari in Syria. In a poem titled Sargon, King of Battle, we see him exhorting his men on the eve of battle after crossing over the Aminus Mountains into Anatolia. Quote, Tomorrow, Akkad will go to battle. The celebration of the manly will be held. The writhing ranks will writhe back and forth, two women in labor, bathed in their own blood. Where are true comrades who just look on at the celebration? Only the coward will stand aside. So there, any king who would rival me, let him go where I have gone." End quote. In other such poems, the words that are put in the mouth of Sargon are those of destruction, of storm strongholds and cities reduced to ruins, of populations uprooted, exiled, with only their bones remaining, burnt or left to the rats. What do we make of this? It is an abject portrayal of empire, utterly devoid of clemency, benevolence, or any pretense of moral rectitude. The picture we get of this Bronze Age empire is that might makes right. However, one cannot help but feel that there is something almost refreshing about this unabashed honesty, and the lack of pretended moral superiority which later empire builders would cloak themselves in. On the other hand, the grandiosity on display is a historical constant, but so too it seems is satire. Within only a few centuries of his death, a text known as Sargon, Lord of the Lies, 
poked fun at the excess of sargonic propaganda through the use of clever wordplay, conflating the Akkadian word for lies with the similar sounding Sumerian word for writing. This made it clear that the people of Mesopotamia knew well how to take an imperial hegemon's claims with just a grain of salt. But in addition to giving us destruction, grandiosity, and satire, we see the first empire in history also contributing to some measure of material progress. Even if Sargon was the prototypical warrior king who spent almost the entirety of his reign on campaign, it was not all raising cities and burning farmsteads. There were also widespread road and canal building projects, and the establishment of trade routes and a postal system. With the Persian Gulf safely in Akkadian control, its harbors became frequented by ships coming from the cities of Magan and Dilmun in the eastern Arabian Peninsula, and from the faraway city of Meluha near the Indus River. Even though it would fall on his successors to solidify control over many of the territorial gains and resources that he had secured, by the end of Sargon's reign, the foundations for an empire had been set in stone. And it was this, in addition to the sheer scope and scale of his conquests, that distinguished Sargon from the would-be emperors, like Ionatum of Lagash, Enchakushana of Uruk, and of course, Lugazagezi of Uma. Sargon was the culmination of the proto-imperial process that had begun in Sumer decades and centuries ago. He was the outsider capable of transcending the ancient vendettas of squabbling city-states, the Philip of Macedon arriving after the conclusion of the Peloponnesian Wars. But at this point you may be asking, what foundations for empire did Sargon set exactly? What did he do after his conquests to ensure that his empire would outlast him? The first thing to understand is that, although he was not known for his clemency, Sargon was a pragmatic ruler, leaving in charge many of the same city governors, or enses. He also allowed these cities to enjoy a level of autonomy, namely the freedom to use the Sumerian language and worship the same gods, with this crucial difference. The ense was no longer a divinely ordained shepherd of the people, answerable only to his patron deity. Now he had to answer to Sargon and his successors, and also to send tribute and taxes. It would fall on Sargon of Akkad's greatest successor to standardize weights and measures for the purpose of improving imperial tax collection. But already, scribes were expected to adopt Akkadian when engaged in accounting, record keeping, or the production of royal inscriptions. Furthermore, unlike with the Enses, Sargon was not above confiscating the estates of smaller landlords, entrusting their property to Akkadians instead. Here's where it gets interesting. Under Sargon and his successors, one was considered Akkadian not simply on the basis of birth, but also merit and loyalty. That meant you did not have to be born in Akkad to be Akkadian and to rise through the ranks, hold office, and earn imperial favor. You simply had to be capable and trusted by Sargon and his family. Thus, this meritocratic system of patronage gave rise to an inchoate Akkadian identity, formed on the basis of a common language and pantheon of gods. But this pantheon of gods was not yet entirely welded together. It would take a marriage alliance to accomplish that. For you see, lacking any equals, Sargon gave his daughter's hand not to a man, but to a god. That is, he named her a high priestess devoted to the cult of the Sumerian moon god Nana, also known as Sin in Akkadian. We know of this because of an alabaster disc found in Ur, the city her temple was located in. This disc refers to the wife of Nana and daughter of Sargon of Akkad, bearing the illustrious name of Enheduanna, meaning ornament of heaven. The transliteration of the name Enheduanna suggests that it may have begun as a title, as indeed may have been the case with the name Sargon itself, which transliterated an Akkadian to something like the legitimate ruler. The temple that Enheduanna oversaw in Ur, the birthplace of Abraham, was rivaled in importance only by the city's palace. In fact, it was probably the most important temple in the Sumerian world, which in a holdover from the days of so-called temple rule, still afforded great veneration to these sprawling complexes encompassing not just sites of worship, but also residences, barns, storage houses, and gardens. As high priestess, Enheduanna commanded a staff of hundreds or maybe even thousands of attendants, running the gamut from her estate manager Ada, to her hairdresser Elum Palilis, to the destitute and downtrodden, 
to the nameless laborers and gardeners and herdsmen and healers and weavers. Add to this army of attendants the fact that she was the daughter of the most powerful man in the known world, and one can begin to fathom the power En Heduana wielded, which she would use to spearhead the greatest project of religious syncretism Mesopotamia had yet seen, presiding over a cross-dressing, androgynous clergy dedicated to Nana and his daughter Inanna, who had the power to turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man, we are told. En Heduana composed over 40 poems with themes ranging from spirituality to war. In En Heduana's Lament on War, her tone belongs to that of a different era, so different from the sargonic inscriptions that one reads in such great numbers. It reads, quote, You hack down everything you see, war god. Rising on fearsome wings, you rush to destroy our land, raging like thunderstorms, howling like hurricanes, screaming like tempests, thundering, raging, ranting, drumming, whiplashing whirlwinds. Men falter at your approaching footsteps. <laughs> tortured dirges scream on your lyre of despair." End quote. Yet this Enheduanna, who has been hailed as the first author that we know by name and history, is best known for her three hymns dedicated to Inanna. Inanna was none other than Ishtar to the Akkadians, the same goddess who had showered Sargon with such good fortune, and who in essence the Hittites, Greeks, and Phoenicians alike worshipped under different names. In the hymn Inin Segura, Enheduanna pioneers the ecstatic literary style that later religious texts would employ. It reads, quote, You are magnificent, Inanna. Your name is praised. You alone are magnificent. My lady, I am yours. This will always be so. May your heart be soothed towards me. Your divinity is resplendent in the land. My body has experienced your great punishment. Lament bitterness, sleeplessness, distress, separation, mercy, compassion, care. Lenience and homage are yours, and to cause flooding, to open hard ground, and to turn darkness into light." End quote. By comparison, the Psalms of the Bible tended to lack an Heduanic sensuality, with only few exceptions like the Song of Songs. Ultimately, and Heduana succeeded in fusing Akkadian and Sumerian deities into something resembling the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods, which it seems to have directly inspired. She transformed Nana from an inscrutable god to a more compassionate one, and Inanna from a local fertility deity into the Queen of Heaven. She was her father's daughter, competent and capable, but in a different sense, she could not be more different. Her grave would be honored long after she was gone with offerings that reveal to us that even during such an unforgiving and violent epoch, there was some room for mercy. But it would not be mercy. It would be force that kept Sargon's empire together. Even at the end of his reign, Sargon was preoccupied with crushing one rebellion after another. He faced resistance at various times from the Sumerian Enses in the very center of his empire that he had thought to spare, as well as the hardy frontier peoples like the Elamites in the east and the Suberians in the north, and it would be much the same with his successors. And yet despite this unending onslaught, one imagines that Sargon died knowing all too well that he would be remembered long after he was gone. What Alexander the Great was to the Mediterranean, Sargon the Great would be to Mesopotamia. Many other conquerors would come after him, but at least as far as we know, he will always be the first to have carved out an empire, establishing a dynasty that would follow in his footsteps. Much like the city builders of Uruk, the empire builders of Akkad were building something that was meant to last, and they were far from finished. The story of the Akkadian Empire is one dominated by gods, great men, and battles to the extent that perfectly sober-minded historians have referred to it as the heroic chapter of Bronze Age history. The barely concealed excitement of these historians comes from the fact that Mesopotamia now had larger-than-life, world-changing figures of flesh and blood like Sargon the Great and his grandson Naram-Sin. Figures whose historicity is better accounted for than that of Gilgamesh, 
that other giant of the Mesopotamian canon. As such, it is all too easy to forget that there were ordinary people out there, the playthings of these heroes, who spent their days eking out what then constituted an ordinary existence. Surrounded by violence and preoccupied with basic subsistence, the sons and daughters of this earliest of empires leave behind evidence of a sophisticated civilization with a dynamic cultural, artistic, and intellectual scene that was both a continuation of their rich past, but also evolving towards something grander. It was an evolution in both substance and style in the direction of empire. We can characterize the Akkadian Empire as a decentralized and tributary one, affording a significant degree of autonomy to each city so long as it paid up with grain, silver, or other commodities. And because it came so early in the human story, it did not actually call itself an empire. Terms such as emperor or imperial did not yet exist, and so you'll hear me speak of kings and royals today, even if for all intents and purposes, the Akkadian Empire was something very different from the Mesopotamian kings that had come in the past. Now, in describing the Akkadian Empire, I mentioned that it was decentralized. This would be a recurring pattern with pre-industrialized agrarian empires, in which the imperial apparatus is only so sophisticated and the watchful eye of the ruling court extends only so far. Add to that the storied past of Sumerian civilization with its wellsprings of political, cultural, and intellectual innovations, and the fundamentally decentralized nature of Akkadian rule becomes even more palpable. As such, the Akkadians permitted the cities of Sumer to speak Sumerian, worship the same patron deities, and celebrate feast days in accordance with their own calendars. Not only that, the Akkadians borrowed and built on these traditions, co-opting cuneiform writing and the idea of the divine right of kingship. Before Sargon's conquests, the Akkadians had mere hegemons whose legitimacy was derived solely from their ability to overpower or outmaneuver opponents. But once the Akkadians found themselves in control of Sumer, they quickly adapted the idea of universal, god-ordained kingship, which was by then enshrined in the Sumerian king list. This debt to Sumerian civilization did nothing to dampen the seemingly unquenchable Akkadian demand for tribute. In fact, the idea of universal kingship brought into practical being for the first time may have merely fueled it. The collection of tribute was indispensable to the management of the Akkadian Empire, first for feeding the urban population of Akkad and other cities with insufficient grain reserves, and secondly for the armies that were responsible for squashing resistance at home and securing plunder abroad. Although Sargon initially kept the Sumerian Enses, or lords, in charge of their respective cities, after a series of rebellions broke out against him and his successors, they gradually became replaced by Akkadian Enses. It fell on these Enses to collect tribute from their subject populations. Unlike the Mesopotamian nobility of later times, this new class of Enses did not find it necessary to make any claims about a long and illustrious lineage, most likely because they had no such noble pedigree to speak of. As we noted in the last episode, many of the new Akkadian elite did not even come from Akkad. Instead, this class was characterized primarily by loyalty to the royal family, which was proved through continual demonstrations of fealty in the form of gifts, feasts, military service, able administration, diplomatic entreaties and orations, and of course, tribute. In return, Akkadian elites were rewarded with bountiful tracts of Sumerian farmland. Some of this land was newly cultivated, but much of the best land was bought or outright confiscated from the original Sumerian landlords, an increasingly disaffected class that had good reason to be outraged by the ostentatious displays of wealth exhibited by this class of nouveau riche Akkadians. One such display of wealth was the collection of slaves and servants that Akkadian elites would keep sequestered in their household. Most of these slaves had Sumerian or Akkadian names, some had families, but many were single women who had been taken captive. They were rarely freed, often attempted to escape, and could be branded or otherwise mutilated by their owners. 
In other words, this was a form of chattel slavery, whereby slaves were property to their owners. However, unlike the slavery practiced by the Romans and other civilizations, slaves were a small minority of the Akkadian population and were not put to work on vast agricultural estates or grand building projects. Instead, slaves were used for household work, and interestingly, the words for servant and subject were the same as the word for slave. Indeed, in some cases, the lot of an everyday subject of the Akkadian Empire engaged in backbreaking labor in the fields may not have been much better. Let us now speak about what the life of this everyday subject was like. Among historians studying this period, there are two models of the Mesopotamian economy. The first model claims that Akkadian governance involved the redistribution of basic necessities from the landlords to the masses, who were compensated for civic or military service. As such, there was little need for an open market. The second model holds that most of the population tended to be self-reliant, and left to their own devices when it came to matters of subsistence and the accumulation of resources. Communities that preceded the Akkadian period stayed intact, and shared the risk of bad harvests, floods, and disease. The second model seems closer to the truth, and more in line with our understanding of the Akkadian Empire as a decentralized one. There is some evidence of the distribution of rations within the confines of the long-established temple system, army, and building projects. But on the whole, the Akkadians behaved like conquerors. They took more than they gave, exploiting populations, foreign and domestic alike, for grain and luxury goods, which could then be used to pay for the means of exploitation, that is, the armies. Herein was a self-reinforcing cycle, a genuine paradigm shift from the days of pre-Akkadian Sumer, when the average city worked to gain an agricultural surplus that it could then use to trade with other cities and afford a labor force for the completion of civic projects. Nonetheless, more recently scholars have emphasized that there were moderating influences, like the temple system and local assemblies. It would fall on the kings of Ur who would succeed the Akkadian Empire to centralize things further, by maintaining a large, dependent pool of labor. But the common thread before and after the Akkadian conquest was that agriculture formed the backbone of the economy. Most people worked the land and ate what they grew, or at least what remained of it. These people either owned a farmstead or rented one from a landlord. Barley and wheat were the most common crops, although we know of quite a range of foods and spices that were grown or gathered, like onions, lentils, chickpeas, dates, figs, apples, grapes, pomegranates, coriander, cumin, cress, honey, syrup, and nuts. On average, the size of a privately owned farmstead was 6 hectares, while a tenant farm was double that, 12 hectares. In tenant farms, roughly one-half to two-thirds of the crop would go to the landlord, while the remaining crop would suffice to feed a family of about six people. After much of Sumer's most arable land was redistributed to royal favorites, such small farms were joined together to form sprawling Akkadian manorial estates. This constituted a fundamental difference between Sumerian and Akkadian agricultural techniques. While Sumerian agriculture was marked by intensive cultivation of small tracts of land, Akkadian agriculture was extensive. The Akkadians simply had a lot of land that they could till, and they entrusted vast tracts of this land to royal favorites. This allowed the Akkadians a measure of control over grain flows. We hear of 900,000 liters of barley being carefully accounted for in the city of Adab, with more than 100,000 liters being sent to Akkad, according to the cuneiform dictate of a scribe's clay tablet. In the northern parts of Sumer and in Akkad, a different form of subsistence dominated, animal husbandry. Sheep, cattle, goats, and donkeys were raised, producing wool, milk, leather, and meat, all of which were valuable commodities. Curiously, we also hear of a hybrid draft animal called the Kunga. Part domesticated donkey and part wild ass, its convoluted heritage was the butt of Sumerian jokes. There is not much record of poultry during this period, but we do hear of geese, ducks, and fowl being fattened in preparation for feasts. There is similarly no record of pig husbandry, but we find no evidence for the consumption of pork being considered a taboo. In fact, it may have been a delicacy. The third form of subsistence, alongside farming and animal husbandry, was fishing. 
As a former River Valley civilization, one expects this of the region. And sure enough, there is an old Sumerian proverb that went as follows, quote, Be there commerce in a city, a fisherman caught the food, end quote. We know of a delivery of 60,000 fish along with turtles and water birds that made their way from Lagash to Akkad. And we also know that the Euphrates great carp and Nagar catfish were great delicacies. Notwithstanding the importance of this economic activity, fishing was a menial, smelly, and low status profession. Boat building, on the other hand, seems to have been a greatly respected profession with chief boatman being an important title at court. Slaves that knew this craft also fetched a better price. And little wonder why, boats sailing up and down the Tigris and Euphrates were indispensable for the transport of grain and other basic commodities powering the Akkadian economy. Because limiting factors existed in the form of a lack of wood, unstable currents, and the diversion of waterways for the purpose of irrigating crops, Artificial waterways and canals were made in the pursuit of efficiency. The average Acadian barge was roughly 5 to 7 meters wide and 12 to 15 meters long, capable of carrying a whopping 30 to 40 tons. The word for great boat was magula, or so we think, while the word for a plain old regular boat was asmagur. But no matter how one subsisted, grain was the most important commodity by far serving as a sort of proto-currency used for the purchase or sale of goods, lending, leasing, and more. We know, for example, of a temple official in the city of Adab purchasing a journey for 300 gur, i.e. 900 hectoliters of grain. Silver functioned in much the same way, and merchants would source distant goods for people by accepting either silver or grain in exchange. That leads us to the other trades that were practiced in the Akkadian Empire whose practitioners did not work the land and had to rely on selling their goods in order to provide for their families. Two such trades were woodworking and metallurgy. Although our knowledge of woodworking is obstructed by the fact that works made out of wood decompose all too quickly, we must imagine that there were some spectacular creations made of willow, tamarisk, pine, date palm, poplar, hackberry, juniper, fig, olive, cedar, Persian oak, and more types of trees. We know much more about metallurgy, which had a long pre-Akkadian tradition. In fact, by the time of the Akkadian Empire, there were already 128 words in the lexicon devoted to the description of copper instruments. But these craftsmen, whether they worked with wood or metal or other materials, did not figure highly in the social hierarchy of the empire an all too unfortunate mistake of basically all agrarian civilizations right up to the 19th century. Nonetheless, we see the scope and scale of these crafts reach new heights, as for example with the experimentation with alloys. The most famous of these alloys, one of copper and tin, is bronze, which gave its name to this epoch in history. At this time, the bar for what constituted bronze among historians is quite low, at about 2-5% to 5 tin content. The rarity of tin is what made bronze uncommon. Copper, by comparison, could be sourced from nearby Kurdistan and Tehran, and could be combined with silver, arsenic, and lead to form different alloys. In addition to its possible use in alloys and as a proto-currency, we see silver being incorporated into utensils, jewelry, and diadems, which must surely have impressed even as they further widened the gulf between rich and poor. We also observe the first large-scale copper works being made using a technique involving the creation of a wax figure covered in clay and melted so that a clay mold remains. This allowed the craftsmen to pour molten copper into it. We do not know if the Akkadians invented this technique, called the lost wax process, only that the scale of it surpassed what came before. In general, a hallmark of the Akkadian Empire, as with many other imperial civilizations, would be the profusion of raw materials that flooded into its borders as a result of conquest and trade, mainly metals, woods, and stones like lapis, carnelian, and serpentine, all admired for their exoticism. This, combined with the eagerness of a newly ascended aristocratic class to display its wealth, created a flourishing market for luxury goods. 
As such, workshops expanded in size and sophistication, with tasks becoming specialized and mass production techniques being developed, especially with pottery. Now, let us talk about what we know of the people themselves. In inscriptions, we hear the Sumerians called the black-headed ones for their dark hair, though we must imagine that the Akkadians, the Semitic neighbors to the Sumerians, looked quite similar. Men and women alike wore their hair long, and as far as we can tell from the steles, the men seem to have sported mullets. Truthfully, the fact that we can say the mullet is one of the oldest hairstyles out there, and is well attested to by Bronze Age era steles, caught me utterly by surprise. Noble men and women, on the other hand, had more elaborate hairdos, sporting braided coiffures. A statue we once believed to depict Sargon of Akkad, which we now think represents Naram Sin, has an impressive man bun that holds up pretty well even in this day and age, unlike the mullet. To further set themselves apart from the masses, the elite would also wear silver and gold necklaces along with other jewelry, cosmetics, and lavish clothing. In the age of Naram Sin, something like a sartorial revolution took place. We see Akkadian elites wearing togas that were tucked into a corner over the right breast, secured with a garment pin. It was the beginning of a Mesopotamian fashion that would last centuries. In addition to sporting new hair and clothing styles, members of the Akkadian aristocracy would amuse themselves with lavish feasts with a stunningly wide array of foods available, especially when a royal delegation was in attendance. We hear of beef, mutton, goose, and venison, as well as other game being served, probably much to the pleasure of a ruler like Naram Sin, who was something of a prolific hunter. In addition to game, dishes with chickpeas, lentils, nuts, cheese, honey, juniper berries, apples, figs, and dates were served with white wine. These feasts were overseen by cupbearers, like the one we hear of at Girsu. A man named Misag was the cupbearer there and he may very well have been the same Assad who became governor of the city. Perhaps another example, like Sargon, of a cupbearer brought high. Outside of palace feasts, leavened and unleavened bread was consumed, the difference between the two being the former's inclusion of a leavening agent, like yeast. There were also dairy products like milk, cream, cheese, clarified butter, and yogurt cakes called kishik. And for the preservation of meats and a little bit of flavor, we hear of salt being rationed out to those engaged in military or civic service. <laughs> Lastly, we know that Akkadians and Sumerians living in the empire continued the long-established tradition of brewing, a term that predated both Sumerian and Akkadian. Let us conclude by speaking about the artistic and intellectual pursuits of the Akkadian and Sumerian people. This was a time known as the classical era of Mesopotamian sculpture, and of all the arts, it is sculpture where contemporaneous advances were most impressive. Like with metallurgy, there had already been a long tradition of sculpture, but Akkadian sculptures were in a league of their own. Often depicting the Sargonic line, these sculptures were idealized with well-proportioned musculature and virile, masculine features. They were also bigger than what had come before, weighing 400 kilograms or more. During the reign of Manishtusu, we hear of a sophisticated school of sculptors creating life-size naturalistic statues of the ruler. Made in diorite, these statues were a far cry from the stiff and rigid statues of the past, possessing lifelike limbs, muscles, and garments, something anticipating the ease of a Greek statue in contrapposto. In addition to statues, stele were made to celebrate Akkadian conquests ever since the reign of Sargon, who ordered these stone slabs featuring scenes of battle to be erected in all corners of his empire. One work in particular, the Victory Stele of Naram Sin, stands out as the pinnacle of this art form. Standing roughly six and a half feet tall and now safely ensconced in the Louvre, this stele depicts Naram Sin, the legendary grandson of Sargon towering over friend and foe alike as he tramples an unfortunate member of the Lullaby people beneath his foot. Most notably, even more so than his height, is the helmet that Naram Sin wears. It is a bullhorned helmet, such as was worn by gods, not men. As we have discussed, Naram Sin was a prolific hunter, 
and he famously felled a bull in distant Syria, which this could have been a reference to. But make no mistake, more so than a reference to his hunting excursion, this was a deliberate depiction of his assumed divinity. And as we shall see, later Mesopotamians would accuse Naram-Sin of eventuating the fall of the Akkadian Empire through his hubris. Unlike Sargon, he was not content with merely being the lover of a god. He sought to be a god himself. Personally, I find this immensely interesting when coupled with the satanic imagery of a horned helmet, even if the stele predates Christianity by thousands of years. From the very beginning, it seems, have we, the human race, aspired to godhood. But as regards the other arts, we know that the people of the Akkadian Empire sang and played instruments like the lyre, harp, and drums. But unfortunately, when it comes to music, we don't know much more than that. We do know a thing or two, though, about the poetry of the period, even if it is all basically ascribed to one person, En Heduana. The works of En Heduana, written not in Akkadian but Sumerian, span a wide variety of genres one such being the theme of exploration. It read, quote, O On, the king, I will roll out your name to the ends of the land like a surveyor's line. May he, the Akkadian king, take control in the mountain. May he explore it, learning its dimensions. May he go forth on the holy campaign of heaven. May he learn how far it goes, end quote. In the Akkadians, we see the inchoate spirit of exploration, which in much later empires would define their very essence and justification for being. There were also intellectual and bureaucratic advances in the form of map making, mathematics, cuneiform, and cylinder seals, those gifts passed down from the ancient city of Gilgamesh, Uruk. We know of exercises for finding the areas of squares and rectangles as well as the lengths of the short sides of triangles, precisely the sort of elementary mathematics that would be useful for sizing up and divvying out plots of farmland. We also find some of the earliest maps of, you guessed it, farmland, as well as building sites and the domains of provinces that roughly corresponded to the borders of past city-states. With regard to cylinder seals, these continue to be used in much the same way as in the past, rolled onto a surface to imprint an image that legitimized the quality or authenticity of a good or decree. These seals also constituted a prolific art form, with popular icons including the sun god of the Mesopotamian pantheon, Shamash, and the Akkadian rulers, who were sometimes rendered in a very primal, masculine way, big, naked, and hairy. I have to admit, I find it pretty funny to conjure up the image of a worn down bureaucrat stamping his approval of a grain shipment with the image of his big, naked, and hairy Akkadian boss. But now, as we reach the end of our tour, let us discuss that fundamental invention that may perhaps be called the wellspring of the city and civilization itself, the writing system. The cuneiform script that had been pioneered in Uruk was gradually adapted to better accommodate the Semitic language of Akkadian, and in the process it was raised to new heights. A fine calligraphic tradition emerged, with cuneiform characters lovingly rendered with plenty of space in between them on rectilinear clay tablets used as administrative documents. In fact, the Akkadians seem to have systemized things with their choice of tablets by using square or rectangular tablets for composite quantities of goods and rounded tablets for single transactions. The angle of orientation on cuneiform characters was also shifted 90 degrees so as to be easier read. Not to mention, it was during this period that cylinder seals were fused with cuneiform for the first time. Prior to that, in the days of temple rule at Uruk, cylinder seals were not rolled on surfaces that had cuneiform characters. Much had changed since that time we covered in the first episode of this series on the Akkadian Empire, and, as far as we can tell, much of the advances described today took place during the reign of a single ruler, one I have mentioned multiple times, Naram Sin, the man who sought to be a god. In the next episode, we will cover his reign, as well as those who came before and after him, but as we shall see, 
none would compare to his legend, which, though controversial, nonetheless marks him out as special, as the greatest of Sargon's successors, even if perhaps his actions would occasion the fall of the Akkadian Empire. Following in the footsteps of greatness is never an easy thing, especially at the dawn of history. This was the Bronze Age, when glory could not be bought or borrowed or bartered, except with the price of blood. Sure, there was praise to be earned for building roads and consecrating temples and giving grain to the hungry. All of that was very well and good. However, it was the virtues of war, not peace, that enabled a man to be great. Tragically, there was no other playbook, only the one written by Sargon in the blood of his enemies. And his successors, knowing no other way, followed it to the very letter, even as it became certain that their creation could never last. The year was 2279 BC, or thereabouts, and Sargon of Akkad was dead after a reign of 56 years. He was succeeded by his son, Rimush, whose ascension was accompanied with the outbreak of rebellion. Despite the many uprisings his father had put down, resistance to Akkadian hegemony was evidently reinvigorated by what the Sumerians perceived to be a moment of weakness. Now, with Sargon out of the picture, the Sumerians reasoned that they had a chance to break free of the Akkadian yoke, disenchanted as they were with rendering tribute to Akkad in the form of grain and other commodities. Even if the Akkadian Empire was fundamentally decentralized in nature, and willing to co-opt those born outside of Akkad into the inner circle, there were probably other reasons for Sumerian discontent beyond the extraction of tribute, including the dispossession of land first from small Sumerian landlords and later the Enses, the ostentatiousness of a newly ascendant Akkadian aristocracy, and finally the embitterment that any sophisticated civilization might feel in a state of subjugation. But however legitimate these misgivings were, Sumerian resistance was summarily crushed by Rimush and his armies. The Sumerian cities of Uma, Ur, Lagash, Adab, Deir and Kezulu were all brought to heel once again. After all these millennia, we still have the cold clinical casualty counts of these reconquests, carefully recorded in cuneiform inscriptions by the scribes of Rimush. In all, something like 23,000 Sumerians were supposed to have been killed in battle, with twice that number being taken captive. A staggeringly large portion of the fighting men of Sumer had suddenly been neutralized, and it was the fighting men who fared the worst, sentenced to death, slavery, or a lifetime of hard labor, such as stone cutting in the distant Zagros Mountains in present-day Iran. In a further act of reprisal, Rimush seized some 134,000 hectares of farmland outside of Lagash and Uma. That's about 331,000 acres, or the equivalent of 250,000 football fields, making this the largest land transaction, if it can be called such, that is documented in Mesopotamian history. These vast swathes of land were entrusted to the royal favorites that formed the core of the Akkadian elite, allowing Rimush to consolidate his control of the region and turn his attention elsewhere. Rimush proceeded to squash resistance around Akkad in the very heartland of his empire before going on the offensive against Elam in the east. He was successful yet again, reasserting Akkadian control in Elam and Susiana and returning with even more plunder and slaves. We have a depiction of one such unfortunate slave, portrayed as naked, bound, 
and hauled forward by a nose ring attached to what seems to be a pole. To celebrate his successes, we hear that Rimush had a statue made of himself in tin, a rare and therefore immensely valuable metal in the region, which could be alloyed with copper to form bronze. We know this by way of an inscription associated with the statue that equated Rimush with the gods, something unprecedented at the time. Curiously, we have another work from this period called Head of a Ruler. Simply named but intricately carved, its original name and subject elude us. Made of a copper alloy, it may depict Rimush, although we lack the evidence to confirm this. Personally, looking at this individualized, life-sized copper head, with its intelligent brow, heavy-lidded eyes, and delicate mouth, I find it difficult to believe that Rimush would have himself depicted this way. Although only hollows remain where eyes should be, there is a kindness and refinement that emanates from this face that does not accord with the historical image we have of Rimush, the one he spent the nine years of his reign cultivating with lengthy recitations of the number of enemy dead, captured, and enslaved. But perhaps there was simply another side to the man that would not make him the only butcher in history with a sensitive side, far from it in fact. Whatever the case, after almost a decade of rule, Rimush met his end in a dramatic palace conspiracy. As Mesopotamian tradition has it, he was killed not by dagger, sword, or bow, but instead by a group of courtiers armed with cylinder seals, the very instruments meant to legitimize his decrees. The mechanics of the murder are a mystery to us. Rimush was either beaten to death, strangled to death with the cords from which cylinder seals could be suspended, as if on a lanyard, or stabbed to death with the pins that cylinder seals could be attached to cloaks with. One wonders whether Rimush's brother, Manish Tusu, was involved in the conspiracy, for it was he that now ascended to the blood-spattered Akkadian throne. Manish Tusu inaugurated his reign by pushing even further east than his brother had, beyond Susa, to seize Anshan and Shirihom. We are also told that he assembled a mighty fleet and conquered 32 cities beyond the sea, those that speckled the Persian Gulf Coast. In taking these lands, Manish Tusu secured for his empire a fresh supply of silver as well as diorite, a precious stone that breathed new life into the art of Akkadian sculpture, which became increasingly naturalistic, grandiose, and tailored to royal and funerary themes. Beyond that, we know that Manish Tusu established new trade routes, most notably with the faraway civilization of Egypt. And, closer to home, he rebuilt the Temple of Ishtar in Nineveh. In total, Manish Tusu ruled for 15 years. It was a longer reign than his predecessors, and seemingly more peaceful judging by the lack of inscriptions and other such commemorations related to military conquests. But it ended in almost exactly the same way as his brother's reign did, with a palace conspiracy that left Manish Tusu slain at the hands of his own courtiers. He was succeeded by his eldest son, Naram Sin, who had been groomed for command while accompanying his father during his military campaigns. Supposedly, he was also a great hunter, felling a wild bull in Syria. Of all of Sargon's successors, Naram Sin would be the greatest without question, the only one who could rival him in martial prowess and fame. During Naram Sin's 37-year reign, the Akkadian Empire reached its territorial zenith, stretching from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean and encompassing parts of present-day Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, Syria, and Turkey, with influence in modern Oman, Pakistan, Lebanon, and other regions that either pay tribute or trade it with the Akkadians. In his day, Naram Sin would come to be known as King of the Four Quarters of the Earth, the first Sargonic ruler to take this title. 
anticipating the triumphs held by the Romans. It was during the reign of Naramsin that all sorts of exotic animals entered the record of Mesopotamia, appearing in art, literature, and inscriptions. Suddenly, we hear of elephants, rhinos, crocodiles, water buffaloes, gazelles, and lions. Of particular importance, as one might expect, is the lion, the king of the jungle, who would become associated with Naram Sin, depicted as he was seated on a leonine throne or mount. As with Sargon, precious little remains about the means by which Naram Sin won his battles but we have a lengthy accounting of the lands he took and the enemies he killed and humiliated, with precise figures given, as was the case with his immediate predecessors, Rimush and Manishtusu. But Naram Sin was in a league of his own, or at the very least, in the same one as Sargon. Like Anzu, the mythical lion-headed stormbird of Mesopotamian tradition, we see Naram Sin flying from one corner of his ever-expanding empire to the other, from the Zagros Mountains in the east, to the Taurus and Aminus Mountains in the west, to the Armenian highlands in the north where he reached the sources of the Tigris and Euphrates, the life-giving rivers of Mesopotamia that had made all of it possible, cities, civilization, and the rest of it. As we have established, our grasp on many specificities related to this period is tenuous, and we don't always know whether a given region was firmly under Akkadian control or merely a tributary. We often hear about reconquests, with peripheral regions seeming to have passed in and out of Akkadian control quite often. Nonetheless, even if some of Naramsin's conquests were really reconquests, Others indicate that he succeeded where his predecessors failed, or at the very least, that he is perceived to have done so. Regarding Naram Sin's conquests in Syria, for example, we have the following inscription. Quote, Whereas for all time since the creation of mankind, no king whosoever had destroyed Arminum and Ebla, the god Nergal, by means of his weapons, opened the way for Naram Sin the Mighty, and gave him Arminum and Ebla. Further, he gave to him the Aminus, the Cedar Mountain, and the Upper Sea, by means of the weapons of the god Dagon, who magnifies his kingship. Naram Sin the Mighty conquered Arminum and Ebla." End quote. In this inscription, we meet two gods that we have not yet crossed paths with. The first is Nergal, god of the underworld and associated with destruction. And the second is Dagon, the god associated with prosperity. One could say that these two deities embodied Naram Sin's reign well, destruction on the one hand and prosperity on the other. As regards the conquests themselves though, there is some debate over the historicity of Naram Sin's claims. Some scholars think that Ebla had already been destroyed by Sargon, or even before that, in 2500 BC, over 150 years before the start of Sargon's reign. Unlike Ebla, we do not even know where Arminum was located. We are told, however, that it had three thick layers of wall surrounding it, but that these were overcome by Naram Sin and his armies, who captured the ruler of the city after a tense standoff in the doorway of his palace. Supposedly, the outer wall stood 20 cubits high, or a little over 13 feet, the inner wall 30 cubits high, or 20 feet, and the citadel wall 44 cubits high, or a little over 29 feet. These were still the early days of walled fortifications, and so it is in this regard perhaps, as a master of the nascent art of siege warfare, that we can consider Naram Sin a trailblazer. But as with Sargon, we have none of the tricks of the trade, nothing like the detailed exploits of Alexander at the Siege of Tyre, for example. And because, again, these were the early days of siege warfare, 
The concept of defending a walled fortification was made out to be cowardly in Mesopotamian tradition, with a later poem likening Naram Sin to a lion snuffing out a fox hidden in his burrow. But this would be far from Naram Sin's most dramatic showdown. The climax of his reign would come after yet another rebellion broke out in Sumer, one that required him to raise his armies nine times in a single year. This time, it was precipitated by Kish and Uruk, both of which sought the support of neighboring cities and peoples and formed coalitions that proved to be existential threats to the Akkadian Empire. Undeterred, Naram Sin's response was to close the gates of Akkad, entreat Shamash, the solar god of justice, rally his army, and then sally out to meet the Kishites and their allies in battle. He emerged victorious and destroyed the remnants of the enemy army in Kish, where the defenders put up a bitter resistance, fighting street by street until the Euphrates, diverted in its course to flood the city, ran red with their blood. Next, Naram Sin fixed his attention on Uruk, who had allied with the Amorite tribe. In rapid succession, he bested the Amorites and then marched on Uruk itself. Like Kish, Uruk, the city of Gilgamesh, which had given the Akkadians so many gifts of civilization, was flooded. Both Kish and Uruk would recover, but the Sumerians had learned their lesson, at least for the moment. Naram Sin was not to be challenged. Following his victory over the Sumerian coalition, Naram Sin plundered the cities along the Gulf before returning home laden with booty and with his rebellion subjects clapped in neck stocks. An inscription commemorating the victory read, quote, Naram Sin the Mighty, King of Akkad, when the four quarters of the earth attacked him together, through the love Ishtar bore him, was victorious in nine battles in a single year, and captured the kings whom they had raised up against him. Because he defended his city in crisis, the people of his city asked of him that he be god of their city Akkad, and they built his temple there." End quote. That's right. Naram Sin had ascended to godhood. In a victory stele commemorating his victory over a Zagros mountain tribe, he is rendered as one, standing at twice the height of those around him, and wearing a horned helmet such as only divine figures were represented with in art and literature. But between the countless battles and the ascension to divine heights, at least in the imagination of his followers, Naram Sin undertook a series of administrative reforms and civic projects, proving himself Sargon's equal not just in war, but also in stewardship. We can assume that much of these reforms were actually put into effect by the Shapiro, an Akkadian word with no Sumerian equivalent for the steward of the royal court. The Shaparim II was the land registrar, whose team of scribes helped him keep an accurate record for the total amount of arable land in the empire. In studying the dynamic between the Shaparim, the land registrar, and the Enses, one observes a precocious sort of state formation taking place, baby steps on the road to the IRS, I guess you could say. Cities in Sumer and elsewhere now had to convert their agricultural output into a new Akkadian standard of measure when rendering tribute, coinciding with an attempt to make the system of weights and measures uniform in the Akkadian Empire. In addition, local administrators had to abide by certain Akkadian mathematical conventions, such as giving a figure for the amount of land that could be cultivated by one team of farmers. There were also new standards imposed on scribes engaged in record keeping, at least for those records submitted to Naram Sin's court. Everything from the clay tablets they used to the cuneiform script itself had to meet the strict expectations of Akkadian officials 
who demanded rectilinear clay surfaces, elegant and broad handwriting, simple and straightforward accounting, and enough space for independent auditors to make their own reports. Looking at the surviving records, one almost feels the need to applaud the Acadians for making an art out of ledger keeping. As regards civic projects, Acadian buildings and commodities dating back to this time show up in the archaeological record of the site of Susa and present-day Syria. Furthermore, Naram Sin had the Sumerian city of Ikur renovated, and we have a document that describes what life was like for the laborers involved in this enterprise, which was overseen by Naram Sin's eventual successor, Shar Kalishari, under whose reign the project most likely reached fruition. From this document, we hear of the purchase of bronze, copper, silver, and gold weighing tons, and the involvement of 77 woodworkers, 86 goldsmiths, 10 sculptors, and 54 carpenters. We also get a description of what the finished product was supposed to look like. There were to be four bisons plated in gold, and two winged dragons made of copper, their bare teeth also plated in gold. To me, this iconography sounds like something plucked right out of an Assyrian courtroom. Clearly, the Akkadians set a warlike precedent for these later empire builders, whose infamy would surpass even theirs. To maintain control of the temple system, Naram Sin appointed not one, but three of his daughters high priestesses. The most notable of these was En Menana, who was made the direct successor of En Heduana as high priestess of Ur. As we have discussed before, this temple was dedicated to the deity associated with the moon, known as Nana in Sumerian and Sin in Akkadian. Therefore, it had particular importance to Naram Sin whose name meant Beloved of the Moon God Sin. Another deity of particular importance was, of course, Ishtar. Temples dedicated to this patron deity of the Sargonic dynasty were erected at Nineveh, Zabala, Adab, and the capital, Akkad. This brings us to an interesting aspect of Naramsin's legacy. Despite his successes on and off the battlefield, and his commitment to erecting temples to please the gods, later civilizations like the Hittites and Babylonians would repeatedly attempt to undermine his legacy, making him out to be a sort of foil to Sargon, disfavored by the gods. Much of this infamy seems to come from one story, the Curse of Akkad, written only about a century after Naramsin's reign. The myth seems to have clear parallels to the Sumerian Sargon legend, with Naram Sin cast in the role of his grandfather's nemesis, Urzababa, the king of Kish who Sargon had been cupbearer to. As far as we can tell, the basis for the legend was Naram Sin's renovation of the Temple of Ikur in Nippur, which was seen as sacrilegious. Like the Sargon legend, the Curse of Akkad was just a story, but it's honestly a much better one. It's got pace, and rhythm, and erudition, all the elements of a successful historiographical myth. Not only is it replete with allusions to the origin story of Sargon, it also demonstrates a familiarity with the norms of Akkadian governance, and understanding of what life was like for the subjects of the empire. And that is to say nothing about the poem's underlying themes, like the cyclical nature of history, the folly of pride, and the loneliness of kings. We are fortunate to have much of the legend remain intact today, and it is regularly quoted by scholars studying the Akkadian Empire in a wide range of contexts. It's simply one of the best sources we have for understanding the legacy of the Akkadians, colored as it was by the bias of the Sumerian poet-historian who composed it. To me, there is little wonder why this story became almost as cherished as the Epic of Gilgamesh in Mesopotamian tradition. It is the first story we have about the fall of an empire, the first of many, and it is well told. But now, let us close this episode with a brief investigation into how the empire actually fell. With the death of Naram Sin, his son, Shar Kalishari, 
who had overseen the ill-fated Ica renovation project succeeded him. Interestingly, it was during Sharkali Shari's 25-year reign that we hear mention of a city called Babylon for the first time, the cradle of a future empire, which may have been conceived in part due to the decline of nearby Kish. Other cities in the region were also said to be on the decline, possibly because of changing climatic conditions, the same reason given for the decline of Uruk way back in the 4th millennium BC. According to recent scholarship, there is some evidence to suggest that the region around the Kaba River, a northern tributary of the Euphrates, experienced dust bowl-like conditions. Downstream, Sumer may have felt the effects of this phenomenon, although not as keenly. More likely, Sumer had been much more impacted by the ceaseless demand for tribute over the course of two centuries of Akkadian rule, as evidenced by the repeated rebellions which had but few lapses. On top of the chronically discontented Sumerian cities, Sharkali Shari also faced a new threat, the Gudians, the prototypical barbaric tribe come from the east to wreak havoc. These were the same mountain people referenced in the Curse of Akkad unleashed by Enlil to plunder and pillage the fracturing Akkadian Empire. Not much is known of them, and they may have appeared on the scene even at the end of Naram-Sin's reign, although Sharkalishari is said to have won victories against the Gudians, as well as the Amorites, Elamites, and rebellious Sumerians, by the end of his reign, the Akkadian Empire seems to have unraveled. The details of it all are disappointingly murky, with few inscriptions remaining, but the Sumerian king list makes the chaos of the period all too clear, pointedly asking, who was king? Who was not king? After Sharkali Shari, there came two other Akkadian rulers that we know of, Dudu, who ruled for 21 years, and his son Shudurul, who ruled for 15. But both of them seem only to have reigned over the region of Akkad, with the people of Gudium, Lagash, Uma, Uruk, and Elam picking apart the scraps of the empire like carrion crows. So then, what can we say about the legacy of this earliest of empires? According to some historians, the Akkadian Empire ushered in the heroic chapter of the Bronze Age period, giving the world Gilgamesh-like figures in the form of Sargon and Arab-Sin, who were more grounded in history. Whereas Sargon succeeded in taking a tribal people and conquering the most sophisticated civilization in the known world, Naram-Sin took the Sumerian civilizing mission further still and proclaimed himself a god. The Sumerian king list had already conceptualized the idea of a universal kingship, but the Akkadians actually brought it to life, despite the fact that ancient Sumer never quite accepted its rule. In conclusion, it was a mixed legacy, a decentralized tributary empire that set new precedents and reached new horizons, although at the meticulously recorded cost of human life and dignity, especially among the Sumerians, without whom there was no foundation for this empire. Little wonder then that we hear of Akkadian sculptures being mutilated despite the futile warnings expressed in their inscriptions. In Assyria, depicted figures had their eyes gouged out, their ears cut, or their heads beheaded, while in Sumer, these figures were habitually smashed into countless pieces. And yet, on the other side of the token, we also hear of worshippers at a temple in Sippar, in the very heart of Mesopotamia, leaving behind offerings to a likeness of Sargon of Akkad. Not only that, we hear of not one, but two Assyrian rulers who would take the name Sargon, and we see Nabonidus and Hammurabi of the Babylonians, and Hattushilu of the Hittites, making favorable references to Akkadian achievements, even as they sought to surpass them. Closer to home, the Sumerian city-states that re-emerged in the wake of the Akkadians, like Lagash, Uruk, and Ur, would emulate the aesthetics and rhetoric of their former subjugator, and build on their civic reforms as in the case of Shulgi, even if they failed to create empires of their own. In sum, the Akkadians, our prototypical empire builders, would be studied, imitated, worshipped, resented, and caricatured long into the future 
by succeeding Mesopotamian civilizations right up to the time of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. But most importantly, they would not be forgotten. The destinies of heaven and earth had been fixed. The monster of chaos that was the raging waters had been stilled.